All right. Um, before we open up God's Word together, um, I want to uh, make mention of two men that I hold in very high uh, regard. I count them as friends um, and want to say thank you to both Bruce and Bruce, um, which always sounds like a law firm to me, Bruce and Bruce, like maybe like a Shark Tank law firm. <laughs> um, but uh, to be able, and I was mentioning to Stacy and Tim this morning, uh, what a privilege it is to be able to hear uh, sermons when you miss them online, and it's kind of this invisible background work that you guys do, and thank you for that. Um, but to be able to be blessed, uh, Bruce Decker, by your words on the Word of God speaking into our life um, was a great reminder from my heart uh, this week as well, um, and Bruce Trefevin bringing us through that core essential thing that we're called to love. The love is the primary characteristic of a follower of Jesus. So uh, thank you. And uh, after church today, as we mentioned, we'll have an opportunity to bring Bruce Decker on board. Uh, today is his day. Uh, elders serve in three-year chunks. What we have found is that the heart that God gives to the shepherds of the church really doesn't change just the call to serve sometimes does, where sometimes it's time to step aside. But uh, when God calls you into that shepherding kind of role, you always do it. It's just a matter of whether or not you're in that official role. And Bruce Decker is offering uh, himself again for another three-year chunk, which we are incredibly excited about. And uh, one of the, the things that I think just resonates for me is that both uh, Bruce Decker, Bruce Trefevin, and myself, we have this common unified vision that the church is called to be a place where we get to disciple one another, which really means that we get to help each other follow Jesus in this life. And for some of us, maybe we've been following Jesus for 20 years but we're just rotating around the mountain and there's no essential growth or we've been devastated by something in life and that God's family would come alongside to help us navigate up the mountain to reach the Lord, to see the Lord's work in our lives, that we would be pliable like clay, that God would mold us to be a little bit more like Jesus, even in the difficult circumstances of life. Or for some people who have never... Um, known about Jesus or the offer of salvation, have never given our lives in repentance, asking for forgiveness of sins, that we would come alongside uh, those folks that might not even be in the church to speak the good news about the river of life that flows from the throne of God, that there's an offer for reconciliation, that we can be friends with God, that we can be God's children forever and ever. And that we would come alongside as a body of believers, discipling one another, helping one another. And a piece of that means we have to open our lives up to be able to share what's happening so that others can speak in. And that's not really a church thing. That's the church thing. Meaning it's not a program. It's just what the people in the church are. It's who we are. That we love each other enough to walk alongside and speak God's word to each other and minister to one another. Um, and if there's ever a role that is most challenging and perhaps in most need of discipleship, I think all of us would agree parenting might be in the running for the top challenge, right? Parenting is not easy. Uh, at least for me, it doesn't come naturally. I love my kids, but how many times do you sit there and something happens and you're like, I don't have any idea what to do. Nobody ever told me this was coming. And, and you have that moment of, how do I handle this? Um, what do I say? What do I not say? Do I share this with others? Do I not? And so... Because we are committed to discipling in all the moments of our lives, uh, we are really excited for November 16th. Did you guys get a postcard, some of the parents? Did it come in the mail? 
All right, I see at least one hand, so if they went out. Um, November 16th, if you are raising kids, uh, it doesn't matter if they're in the nursery, um, if they're on the way, or if they're in high school, even up at, into college. Uh, we want to provide a day up at Alton Bay, uh, November 16th, 9 to 3. This is our first attempt. And so it literally feels like we have machetes in our hand. We're just kind of hacking out this path in order to try to disciple our parents with God's word. Um, I think it's going to be really fun. I think we'll all walk away from it like, God, thank you for that space. Even if it's just that one thing that God gifts us from that day that helps us become better godly parents enjoying the adventure together. So that's my plug. November 16th, uh, we have a super simple RSVP plan. You just email me. Like, that's kind of how that goes. Um, the cost, the church is covering the cost because you guys are generous. Uh, we're covering the cost. We're just asking folks to uh, pay the money for the lunch, which is what that little fee is on the post postcard. So we'll, we'll send out emails. The reason is, um, our directional statement that Bruce Decker put out for us, um, someone mentioned we need to do this more often, and I couldn't agree more. Our directional statement is because Jesus is Lord of all, we will encourage and train one another biblically to follow Jesus in our whole life so that God is glorified. In all the nooks and crannies, we get to do this thing so that ultimately God's name is made a lot of. So if you are able to, uh, please set aside the 16th. And we want to urge you, although this is absolutely a Christ-based, a Jesus-focused day on parenting, it is a parenting day. Meaning your friends are going to be very comfortable as long as they know it's your church doing it. So we're going to use the Bible. We're certainly going to talk about Christ, but we're not going to beat them over the head. We're just going to open the invitation up to them to parent God's way. And so it's not going to be a threatening environment. I think they'll be really encouraged by it. So if you have friends who are in that same phase, feel free. You can cover the cost for them. It's not a big deal. We can cover it. Um, They can do it however you want to. Uh, Just ask us for another invitation, and we'd love to hand it out to them. All right. Um, Speaking of parenting... Grandparenting would be the same thing, sometimes work, sometimes marriage. There are many, many hard moments in life, right? Uh, We've all hit them, where something is not going well. That something could be our income, and we lose a job, and we don't know how we're going to make it. Uh, That hard moment in life might be the moment that your adult child, son or daughter, cuts off the relationship with you, and you don't know what to do. It could be the tears in the middle of the night because you just visited the doctor that day, and that fear is coming into your life, and it's hard. It's hard. And we could go on and on listing these difficult things in life, and and yet Jesus comes on to the scene, and he has these words that says, when you yoke up with Jesus, when you link up with him, his yoke is light, and he makes the burden easy. And you hear those words, and yet the contrast with our real lives is here, and it makes the question come out. What is it that makes something hard bearable? What is it that makes that moment in life that you would never choose to be in and yet you find yourself in, what is it that makes that doable, maybe even considered a light burden? What is that? Here's what I believe. I'm just going to hide this because I keep looking at it. Here's what I believe. I've seen this time and time in your lives, in my life. The factor that makes hard things bearable, perhaps even the burden light, is when we know 
how it all comes out. So let me put you in school, okay? So we're in college together, and we're in a class, and it's just really challenging, and it's hard, and we're studying, and we finally hit the point in the semester where we're stressed out, but we take the next-to-last final test, and we find out our grade is high enough that the final, at the end of the semester, we could get a 50% on that and still get a C or be in the class. Does that not take the stress off the final, right? Like you, I'm celebrating. Some of us would be like, no, I want the A. I'm going to keep stressing out. And that's okay. That's how God has made you. Or um, winter is coming, uh, whether you want it or not. Um, And driving home during a snowstorm, towing a trailer behind you, and you can barely see 10 feet with the snowflakes, how encouraging is it when you finally see whatever your mark is that you're almost home? It could be the lights of your house. It could be that stop sign where you enter the neighborhood, whatever that moment is. From that point to your home, is there not this sense of, wow, nothing has changed. It's still a blizzard. You can't see. You have a trailer behind you, but you have the sense, I know the end. I'm going to make it. There's many examples in life. You're changing jobs. You know, yours you hate. It's just been this stress factor for years, and you're like, I need to get out. And you finally get the offer from another employer that you're really excited about. But you still have to work at your current job for three weeks. How hard does that become? It's light. It's like, I don't have a problem going, the job's exactly the same, my boss is the same, the company's the same, because I know how this thing rolls out. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. It's a sense of a confident hope or a secure future. It lifts the burden of the hard days to make them bearable, maybe even light. So FCCB... um, We have been through, so I get scolded often because we say a hundred essential passages. Truthfully, it's been a hundred days with a whole lot of essential passages per day. So maybe we could average that out to be like, all right, really it's been like 250 or 300 essential passages. In the course of a hundred days, um, if you've been able to make that journey, whether you started it, whether you jumped in midstream or just kind of caught a couple along the way, the message that is clear throughout all of Scripture from the first page to the end is that God has a heart to bless and to give. And his intention, his mission, is that his people expand that blessing out into the world around them. That God blesses in order that we could be a blessing to others. He seeks partners for this mission of blessing. So the story has taken us through the beautiful picture of creation. And then that heartbreak of sin entering the scene and another counselor coming and duping our hearts. And we're exiled from the Garden of Eden and God speaks to a man named Abraham, and Israel is born, and they're enslaved in Egypt. And then God sends a deliverer named Moses, who brings his people out. And we read about Joshua uh, bringing Israel into the promised land, and it's filled with milk and honey, and the fruits are just abundant, and the land is beautiful. And then God gives them kings, and Israel veers away from the Lord to the point that God exiles his very own people to foreign lands, away from his temple. And some of them return, and some of them rebuild the city, but they're wounded, and hundreds of years go by. And the message of John the Baptist comes onto the scene, that God is still on mission. God still wants to bless, and you people have walked away from him, but I'm sending yet another Messiah, a deliverer, 
named Jesus. And Jesus announces this good news that the kingdom is open to all. And he evidences the kingdom with miracles and with teachings. And then there's a death on a cross where Jesus was hung and he died and there's a burial. And three days later, this resurrection that no matter how many times you come across it, your heart just leaps because there's hope back on the scene again. And then in the book of Acts, our readings brought us through the church, given the task of spreading the blessing of God to others. And then Paul writes many letters about how do we live being this follower of Jesus in this world around us. And this past week in Revelation, there's incredible pictures of persecution and suffering and really difficult days for the followers of Jesus. And the question lingering towards the end of Revelation is, Where is all this headed? Not just my life, but ours. And not just our lives, but the whole history of humanity. Is there a point to it? Is there a place that it's going? Is there a future that's secure that might make my challenging, difficult days bearable? We all need... This picture at times. Some of your circumstances, I know they're really hard. Some of your hearts are super heavy this morning. Some I know, some I am not aware of. But I do know this. When you're in that difficult circumstance, when your days are dark, when discouragement is all around you, it is hard to see any future that's different than the current reality you're experiencing. And that your mind tends to spin down that dark path of what will be, not the hopeful path of what Jesus could make it. And so I want to encourage you as we read the last chapter in the story, the end of the book, Revelation chapter 22, this is a message that is written to Jesus' church around the world, through all the years, as well as its intended um, audience. This is a message that's written for you, even this morning, addressed to folks whose burden in life is heavy. It's given to lift the spirit that you and I, even in the day we have, might lift our eyes to see Jesus, because the story is heading somewhere. So if you could turn... To Revelation chapter 22 with me. With Genesis 1 will be the easiest scripture you will ever have to find. Revelation chapter 22. The, the whole book of Revelation up to that point, it's filled with word pictures. And some are, are challenging to understand. And many, many books and many podcasts have been given on uh, what these pictures represent. Um, I'm sure some are right, some are wrong. Some I'll never know if they're right or wrong. But when we get to the end of the story, it's less picture and more message. But along the way, there's been worship and battles and suffering and enemies and victory and yet more worship along the way. And then we're given a picture, after all is said and done, after all the battles are finished, after all the dark days are dismissed, this is the story after the story. This is the chapters after our chapter. This is the epilogue at the end of it all. Revelation chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. Then the angel showed me, the river of the water of life is clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. And what we see in uh, Revelation 20 and 21 is that there's a new Jerusalem. There's a new city that God has created and it's descended onto the earth. And exactly what that looks like and what the process is, I don't really know. But I do know 
that God has restored the place where he has lived among us, the city he called Jerusalem. And it's in this new city that this picture is given. And I want to encourage us in this. People can be hard, right? If you think about the difficulties in life, nearly all of them involve other people because people can be hard. Um, I am at the point in my life I don't mind being alone. Um, And so my family has picked up on this. Like, I will go hiking alone now. Or I will just grab a book and be alone for a period of time, and I'm completely okay with it. And that didn't used to be the case. I used to always want people around, and I don't know what's happening to me, but I'm okay being alone. Some of you are like that, too. And you're like, I come to church because I have to, but if I could do it alone, like, that'd be great. Some of you... um, You're really hard to be around, and that's why you don't like people, and it's just kind of the way it is. But here at the church, we get to love each other and be together. But a lot of us know what that's like, like being alone is okay. And a ton of us, when we picture heaven, we picture this idyllic um, wilderness nature scene, right, where the flowers are just growing tremendously, and it's a mountain outlook that it just as God intended it to be. And nature is where I see God, and the heavens declare the glory of the Lord, and it's right here. And we need to uh, picture nature. And I want to give you a different view. That is not how God views the end of all things. The end of all things, it's always been about people, and it will continue to be about people. It's a city, not a wilderness. And I know we can get amped up about protecting our environment, and I am all about protecting our environment. I like it. But it is not the God I worship. The God I worship is enthralled with people, in civilizations, in culture, in advancement. And I love that because then we can support culture and civilization and people in advancement even as we care about the environment around us. Because the picture is not a wilderness descending. It's not nature descending. It's a city. Because God's heart is for people. Even though he knows us, he still loves us. That's the first thing I see in this thing. It's a city. It's people. And while I like nature, we never, ever will worship nature. In fact, God's, one of his statements that he repeats many times over and over again is, I will be their God and they will be my, that's his heart. His heart is not to be out alone in the middle of his own creation. His heart is to be with his people because he loves us. He loves them. And right down Main Street of this new Jerusalem is a crystal clear river. It's called the water of life, and it's flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. And there's the difference, right? I have yet to see a city um, who down its main street is flowing a crystal clear, beautiful river. You know, we're all familiar with Boston. Um, In fact, one of Boston's most famous songs is, I love that. Right? Because we all see the Charles River and we're like, I'm not swimming in that, ever. Because in the new Jerusalem, in this heavenly scene, everything is flowing out of the throne. It's all coming from God and the Lamb. It's not coming from human selfishness. It's not coming from greed. It's not coming from pollution. It's not coming from our tendencies to take what's good and make it bad which is what brings about all this environmental damage, it's coming from God's throne. And so it's gorgeous in the middle of the city. God is the center and the source of this society, and it's water of life. And I love this one. Where it's this perfect combination of purity as well as community, nature and civilization come together in this one place. Under the throne of Jesus, as it was always meant to be. 
And in verse 2, he continues, On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. I wonder what your mind pictures. I don't know if you picked up, that was a singular noun, the tree of life. It was a singular noun on both sides of the river. Is the river flowing under it? Is somehow it rooted under the river and up? I don't know. God doesn't explain it. All we know is the tree of life is available no matter where you are in this city. It's on both sides of the river. Way back at the beginning of our readings, when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it was the one tree God said don't eat from. Do you remember the second tree that was there? It was a tree of life. And there was never any instruction not to eat from that. And it was the tree that sustained Adam and Eve all along until they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then God said, we can't let them eat from the tree of life because then they will become like us. They're exiled from that tree of life. And here at the end of the story, everything, right down to the last detail and up into the majesty of life itself is given to the people. That it's all been healed. Everything has been accounted for. The gates are wide open to come back to the tree of life. It's in the middle of the city for all to enjoy. And it's producing 12 crops. It's like one every month. I think you could probably take this idea if you're an entrepreneur and run with it and just have like a brand of fruit called like life pears and life apples and life pineapples. And I don't know what this thing is producing, but it's something different every month that the people are like, yes, it's February. It's like a life apple month and Let's go get some, and there's a joy in the city. There's a variety in the city surrounding this tree. The picture goes on in verse 3. No longer will there be any curse. Can you take that in for a moment? There's no longer any curse. There's just... can't even picture what that would be like. It's only blessing all the time, every time. There's no other side of the coin. There's no, yeah, but tomorrow. It's just blessing after blessing. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Because Jesus has done away with the curses. There's no more two sides to the coin. It's always heads. There's no more... Cloud, it's just all silver lining for us. There's no, how was your day? Oh, well, it was good, except it's just good. And the question isn't even how was your day anymore. It's like, how's the past 5,000 years been for you? <laughs> has it been as tremendous as mine? Because I suspect it has. It's just this amazing, bountiful blessing flowing from the throne of God. Just living in the goodness of Jesus. There's no day and night. It's just day. Losing track of time because time just doesn't even matter anymore. And you're left with life and the worship and joy of the Lamb as our orienting reality. 
Sounds crazy good, right? Crazy good enough that we're like, really? So I love what John writes at the end here, verse 6. The angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. You can bake on them. I've seen it. I come from there. I am bearing testimony. It's trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. And I want to read the rest of this and just carry this message that God will, in the end, take care of it all. Here we go, verse 7. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, Oh, do not do it. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers, the prophets, And of all who keep the words of this book, worship God. And then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. Let he who does right continue to do right. And let him who is holy continue to be holy. Meaning... You don't have to take care of it all. Like, there are some things that are just so difficult to change that you might not ever change them. And so, you don't have to. Everything will be taken care of. Everything will be dealt with. In the end, God will take care of it. You don't have to. And so while we strive for justice in this life, and it is worth striving for, at the end, we trust in faith that God will take care of it all for us. Even the things that don't get taken care of in this life. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things say, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. And I want to offer this thought at the end here. When God warns us not to take anything away from the book, one of the things that FCCB will never ever take away is that there is one way to life. There is one way to forgiveness. There is one way to salvation. There is one way to the tree of life. And his name is Jesus. And in Jesus, we have the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus, we have our second chance. In the death and resurrection of Jesus, all of our hope is pinned. 
All of our hope is anchored. And so we preach Jesus kind of week in and week out because that's what we're called to do. And so we keep Jesus the primary center and the invitation that's here, that if any of you are thirsty, let him come. Whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. I want to encourage you guys. This gift of salvation and life, not just in the heavens, but even in the here and now, is offered to us solely in the person of Jesus. And it doesn't come just naturally like, oh, that sounds like a great plan. It comes after God blesses our heart that we want Jesus to be Savior, and we reach out, and in faith, we call Jesus our Lord. We ask for forgiveness, we repent of our sins, and we receive salvation. Like, it's an active thing. We partner up, God starts it, and we kind of work with him to enter salvation. And it's an important piece that we recognize Jesus is Lord and confess with our mouth that God raised him from the dead. And that we don't just sit for years, embracing or absorbing uh, teaching, but that we actively respond to God's word. And we just had a baptism a couple weeks ago. There's a fantastic example of hearing uh, from folks about God working in their lives. And that's a picture of that step we take in partnership with God. But it starts with responding to this invitation. If you're thirsty, Jesus wants you to drink from the water of life. The invitation is for you. If you're weary, Jesus is inviting you to come to him, to find your rest in him. But it takes that response of our soul to respond to the invitation God gives. And uh, Every week, uh, the elders, at least some of us are up front, uh, we have Tons of people in here who love Jesus and would love to walk with you to that place of salvation. Don't let the invitation pass you by because it is the most amazing gift that you will ever be given. And here's my last encouragement to you. What's the last word in the scriptures before the amen? The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. How does God want us to live our piece of this story? I think it's pretty fair to say with grace. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with us. Man, I need that. I need God's undeserved favor in my life because I'm a mess. But God's grace flows into me and Jesus prays for it and John records it. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. What do you think that is? Right? We've heard the message enough so that I can be graceful with others and demonstrate Jesus' grace to them. That the church is not called to just stand against things. That's often the reputation we can have. The reputation I think God wants, and that place is filled with. I'm loved even though I'm a mess. I'm given the words of life even though I don't deserve it. I'm loved and embraced even though out in the world I'm on the edge of society. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you so that we can share it with others. My prayer for FCCB, that we could be graceful enough, that we could disciple one another with God's words, to navigate even the difficult circumstances of life, holding out this grand hope. My day may be tough. My situation may be dark. But I have hope that one day God will set it all right. And that salvation and even the tree of life will be held out for me. I hope you guys have enjoyed the journey through the hundred essential passages um, we may do something similar, smaller scale, so that all of us are kind of reading together in a way that's, uh, this one I, I think probably a lot of us found a little challenging to get all the readings in. But uh, maybe for one of our seasons over Lent, we'll simplify, do something um, that all of us can track along. Because I've enjoyed the conversations personally with you. 
um, as we've kind of been in the same place, uh, thinking the same thoughts. Uh, but I hope you've been encouraged that maybe you know God's story a bit more uh, than you did. Because this, this is the bomb of life. It's hard. It can be challenging. But God's word ultimately is what we need speaking into our lives. And hopefully, hopefully you feel a little more encouraged that, yeah, I came across a verse I was able to use with a friend. That's awesome. That's good stuff right there. And ultimately, seeing the grand story that God blesses, and he blesses most in his son Jesus given for us. Ultimately, for all eternity in his glory. Let me invite our worship team up as we celebrate some of these truths, and I'll close in prayer. Father, the uh, stories, just even in the scriptures, that you persevered through are amazing. You sort of wiped us out time after time after time. Each generation bringing their sin, their idolatry to you. And God, never mind the stories of our own generation. Never mind my own story before you. But God, we love you because you first loved us. You've always taken the initiative. You've always come close. You've always been the one to open the door and invite us to change our hearts, to forgive. God, you've always been the one to start the relationship, to restore the relationship. And your people this morning are so thankful for you sending us your beloved son. God, all of our sins were nailed to the cross with him when we came in faith. All of our darkness, all of our rebellion, and God, now all of our hope, all of our joy is wrapped up in the story yet to come that you are restoring and recreating things to be as you always meant them to be. No more curse, just blessing. But God, may you encourage our hearts to share this news, this good news, this river of life with those that you've placed around us. And God, may your name be made much of as your people share your grace with the world in desperate need. God, thank you for sharing your story with us. Thank you for your perseverance, for your faithfulness to your promises, and to your heart. You are forever good, and we will always worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.